Good morning. How's everybody this morning? All right, good. Welcome to the Cradle to Kindergarten, a new plan to combat inequality book signing event. We're so glad that you were able to be here today. This book is a virtual blueprint on how to reduce educational and economic inequalities by expanding access to educational and financial resources at a critical st stage of child development. Thank you for being here and your interest in making a difference in the lives of our very youngest in New Jersey. After my remarks, Steve Adubato, who will I will formally introduce in a few minutes, will be moderating a panel, starting by, uh, with presentations by the two co-authors. We're so honored that you're here, A.J. Chaudhry and Turin Morrissey. Thank you for being here today. Their pres presentation will be followed uh, by a discussion with experts in the field of, in early childhood care and education. Seal Zalkin, CEO of Advocates for Children of New Jersey, or ACNJ, will be making closing remarks. Seal is nationally recognized for her longstanding efforts and successes in our state. Our guest authors will then be available to sign your books. So Amar Terabrito, Executive Director of the Nicholson Foundation. The foundation is dedicated to improving the health and well-being of vulnerable populations in New Jersey. Today, we're gathered to talk about one of the most important issues facing New Jersey and families nationwide, the devastating consequences of inequality in early childhood. To set the tone, I would first like for everyone to do me a favor. Close your eyes, just for a few minutes. Please close your eyes. Everybody, no peeking, please. Now imagine, just imagine, holding a newborn baby it can be your own, a nephew, granddaughter, or a friend's baby. She is the most peaceful and beautiful being. Allow yourself to feel. We all know that feeling, that wonderful feeling when we cradle a newborn that is swaddled tightly and warm. We are making that infant feel like she is back in her mother's womb, safe and secure. Take your baby and sway him gently back and forth gently back and forth. As you do this, look into his eyes, closed for the moment, but waiting to meet yours as they open. As he awakens, he will feel your joy, your peace. Your calmness will make him feel safe and secure. And after a long and trying day at work, you feel comforted too. What a beautiful thing. Start talking to your baby. Tell her how sweet and beautiful she is. Tell her how happy you are to meet her and tell her how you will take care of her forever. Keep your eyes closed, please, almost for a few more minutes, almost done here. Imagining your baby starting to grow through the days, weeks, and months. He starts to coo, begins to crawl, then takes his first step. He becomes enthralled with the world around him. You love this baby, and you're going to do everything in your power to make sure he reaches his potential. You will keep him safe, nurture him, read to him, making sure he gets the best life has to offer. Now please open your eyes. You know, we all know, you can't do this alone. You will rely on family. You will also need excellent child care with providers who have the best education and understand that the first few years of life are when a baby, baby's brain grows the fastest and that this is the time when the brain is most ready to respond to input from the surrounding world. When you drop off your baby at that child care center that you rely on, you will know that he is being left with people who will keep him safe secure and stimulated, not in front of a TV for hours or left crying with a wet diaper because there are not enough qualified providers to look after all the children in that center. And you will also know that the providers are also taken care of, paid well enough to provide for their own families without stressing about their own bills. Sadly, quality childcare is just a pipe dream for many in New Jersey. Even more so, here's the reality. 
Many jobs have little flexibility and people often need to work when childcare centers are closed. Quality childcare often costs more than people can afford. With people's lives more scattered than ever before, family support systems are often limited and far away. As a community pediatrician with a public health background, I've had the opportunity to work with underserved populations throughout the country. As far away as Alaska, Miami, post Katrina and Rita, I worked in Mississippi and Louisiana, just to name a few places. Everywhere, everywhere I've worked, I find that too many children are not receiving the stimulation they need to grow to their potential and become healthy, happy, and productive adults. While families, rich or poor, want what is best for their children, they struggle to pay the bills, find the best support systems, and simply lack the time a luxury to do what is best. We have a crisis on our hands. We really do have a crisis. It begins with financial instability and manifests as a lack of early care and education for many children. One in three households in the state, more than 630,000 report financial struggles. And while we know that the time between birth and kindergarten is a critical time for child development, we lack the resources to ensure that all children have the opportunity to thrive. Consider that of the nearly 4,000 licensed uh, child care centers in New Jersey, less than half are licensed to provide care for infants and toddlers, less than half. Even worse, these centers lack the capacity for three quarters of the more than 200,000 infants and toddlers with parents in the workforce. Imagine. 150,000 babies wake up each morning in New Jersey with unstable child care situations. Think about the infant you were imagining earlier. Their place in this world is, is defined by you and your actions. And it spans across the many facets of their lives, where they eat, sleep, socialize, and where they learn. But even more than that, Every moment you and each one of us spends in their presence is something they absorb. When we talk about childhood development, while schools and basic necessities matter, we must also consider development that takes place through active bonding by all of us with each and every infant and child in the state. Reading books, being present for their first, their first steps, their first words, and stimulating motor skills through playtime are all such examples. And while we may take it for granted that children need quality time, there are children who not only lack these opportunities, but experience chronic stress and neglect so severe and prolonged that they, adversely, they, they are adversely affected for their, their entire lives. It is therefore up to all of us, all of us in this room today, to work together and develop policies, such as those described in Cradle Kindergarten, to ensure high quality child care throughout the state, as well as systems of support for parents and other caregivers. Thanks to many of you, this past year, we took some really important steps here in the state. We increased the infant toddler care and pre-K subsidy rate, and we added $25 million to pre-K expansion in the annual budget. Those are great steps. They're just the beginning though. I'm confident that we will continue to work together to build on these steps because we know that the future of New Jersey depends on those first few years of life. So now, please allow me to introduce Steve Adubato, who I know for most of you really doesn't require an introduction. Steve is a broadcaster, author, teacher, and motivational speaker, and someone I've had the distinct pleasure of getting to know over the last few months, I guess since September, October, Steve, Steve is an Emmy Award-winning anchor for PBS and a syndicated columnist. He has appeared on Today Show, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, and NPR. The list goes on. And is the author of several books, his latest, Lessons in Leadership. Among the current efforts you will hear about from Steve, as well as from SEAL later on, is a relatively new public awareness campaign, Right from the Start, NJ, which is already making a difference. So I want to thank you again for everything you've done up to date and everything you're going to do together with the rest of us to make sure that our very youngest in the state are taken care of 
and we make sure that the future of New Jersey is as bright as possible. With that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Steve. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I want to uh, congratulate you for finding this particular building. Um, one of the great things about New Jersey and our universities and colleges is how expansive the campuses are. And um, the maps are sometimes helpful. In that regard, in all seriousness, I, I want to say first to Arturo, um, thank you for you and your colleagues at the Nicholson Foundation for believing in us. Um, I represent a not-for-profit as SEAL knows, which is a euphemism for we have to raise money all the time, a not-for-profit PBS production company. We're in this business to try to educate, inform, enlighten, inspire, get people to understand what matters. And while I'm glad that I have the opportunity to sometimes contribute to national commercial broadcast, the fact is you will not find a series called Right From The Start NJ on cable news doesn't seem to fit in, and my job is not to make a speech here, but I'll make it clear that the fact that we have started this initiative called Right From The Start, and I ask you to look in your folders and, and do a couple things. Number one, like us on Facebook. Number two, go to the website. On that website is important material, educational material, advocacy material. You'll see the latest op-ed piece that Arturo wrote together with a uh, Kurt Fields of the Terrell Fund, the two major entities that are supporting right from the start NJ, Nicholson and Terrell. You will see an article that I happen to have written for New Jersey Monthly magazine on this subject. You'll see a range of other important material um, on that site. Go to the site. Also, follow us on Twitter. Enough of the social media piece. But the reality is, I, I'm here for two reasons. Number one, to represent my organization that's very involved in this initiative, and two, because SEAL asked me to. And if you just allow me to do this, and I know I am preaching to the choir, there would be no right from the start. I would not be involved in this initiative trying to make a difference. We're blessed to have four children, all of whom had the opportunity from birth to kindergarten to have the best child care. We don't take that for granted, and we know that for many that is not the norm. So without SEAL, without uh, Advocates for Children of New Jersey, there would be no right from the start NJ, because SEAL, for more than a couple of years, has been advocating, has been educating, inspiring, and helping us all understand why this matters. So the last thing I'll tell you before I introduce our uh, co-authors and our panel for a great discussion is that tomorrow, ironically tomorrow, we are holding a forum, uh, our Right From The Start NJ forum. We'll have a, we will have a range of uh, experts talking about these issues as part of our ongoing series on PBS, on Fios, on NPR, et cetera, et cetera, called Right From The Start NJ. So my being here today is A, because SEAL asked me, B, because it's my responsibility, and also it puts me in a great position to be moderating that forum tomorrow. And I will tell you, uh, reading as much as I could of this book, it's compelling, it's challenging, it's thought-provoking, and in that spirit, I'm going to introduce uh, two of the co-authors who are here. We'll get the conversation going, and we'll get our other panelists into the discussion. First, put your hands together for Dr. A.J. Chaudhry. Dr. Chaudhry is the co-author of Cradle to Kindergarten. He's a visiting scholar at New York University, previously served in the administration of President Barack Obama, remember that, um, as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Human Services Policy in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. Thank you for joining us, Doctor. We're also joined by Dr. Taryn Morrissey, co-author of Cradle to Kindergarten, Associate Professor of Public Policy, School of Public Affairs at American University and non-resident fellow at the Urban Institute. Uh, Dr. Morrissey served as Senior Advisor in Human Services Policy in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the United States Department 
of Health and Human Services, working primarily on President Obama's early learning initiative. Put your hands together for our two co-authors. I'm going to have the rest of the panelists introduce themselves in just a moment, but I just want to get into a couple of questions. Um, AJ, if I can ask you this. The title of the book, Cradle to Kindergarten, A New Plan to Combat Inequity. The biggest inequity in terms of the book's major message, the biggest inequity as it relates to early childhood is, please share with the group. The vastly different experiences that young, the newborns, as, as Arturo described them, experience in their first five years of life. Um, we, for, and we know that um, those, those differences in experiences uh, create vastly different life paths for these children. So um, as Steve indicated, his four kids had the opportunity for high quality care, probably were able to enter center-based care by the age of three, had two years of group learning experience before they entered kindergarten, were grade ready in kindergarten, were ready to take on the world um, and grow. Unfortunately, that's the case for probably just a quarter to a third of uh, kids. And what we've learned in the last 25, 30 years is that those experiences make a huge difference. The, the kids with the most opportunity now are in a better position to learn and contribute than any generation of kids before them but it's only a fraction. And the, 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 the vast potential, the limitless potential of newborns is lost. It's not, it's not that it's lost, it's not fully realized for the other two thirds or three quarters of kids. And we all lose because of that. And so much of, so much of human development and um, capacity building occurs in the first five years that without that, um, we, are, we are locking in inequality. Not only are we locking in inequality, but by giving a few kids such vast opportunity and other kids less, we're actually increasing inequality generationally. So that we've gotten to the point where, um, yes, um, a quarter to a third of American kids can um, experience a more uh, comfortable, uh, opportunity-filled life um, as they uh, move forward. But for more than half of kids, that's is probably not the case that they will exceed their parents' status in life or have more than their, than their, than their parents did. And we also live in a, in a world where with technological change, we're not producing the citizenry we need for economic growth um, in the 21st century. And the thing is, every other leading nation in the world does this. We are the only country in the world that does not have um, paid leave for um, its families. The only other country, not, not even uh, advanced economies, out of 180 nations in the world, the only other country, country that ha does not have um, paid time off for parents at the birth of a child is Papua New Guinea. That's our company in this world. Um, and uh, when, you, when it comes to uh, universal uh, education, almost every country um, starts primary, pre-primary schooling by the age of three. Um, and we don't, we leave it up to families to figure it out. And those families who have the resources come always, uh, almost literally it's uh, close to 80% um, now, put their kids into preschool by age three. But everyone else who cannot afford that um, are rely on the public provision of which it's scattershot and it's um, unequal across the country. So that's basically the, inequal the reason why we, we tied this book to the growing problem in the United States of um, inequality. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Marcin, let me ask you this. We'll get into some of the recommendations in just a minute. Please add to what your colleague has shared with us in terms of the impact, the price we pay as a society for the inequities that your co-author just laid out. What tangible, real price do we pay as a society, as a country, so that we can get people's attention 
and understand that it's not about, quote, them, that's not somehow all us. Am I making too much of that? Sure, no. Talk to us. I, um, we pay in the short term and we pay in the long term and we pay intergenerationally because we're, we're not investing in, in this critical period. So from birth to five is critical, in which there's very, very little public investment, extremely little. And then all of a sudden at, at age five, kids become a public good. But prior to that, they're all parents' responsibility. Um, and in the short term, we see um, kids showing up in their kindergarten classrooms not ready to learn. And so what that means for a kindergarten teacher is they're playing catch up with many, many kids who are not ready. And, and other kids who potentially are ready aren't getting the opportunities they could to build on those skills. Um, that those kids who enter school not ready, those, those achievement gaps um, are present at kindergarten entry. And they're really sustained through K through 12 education. There's, they widen slightly, um, but really the, the um, action to prevent those achievement gaps are, are happening before kids enter the, the kindergarten classroom. Um, we see uh, higher rates of grade retention. We see higher rates of assignment to special education because of, of this. And we know that if kids are retained in grade, um, first of all, that's expensive, period, but also they're less likely to graduate high school. We know that if you don't graduate high school, your job prospects are really limited. Um, you're much more likely to rely on the social safety net, which has many, many holes in it. Um, but we know that um, that's reduced tax dollars in the long term, in addition to all the personal um, uh, issues. We know that um, kids who um, are enter kindergarten not ready to learn are more likely to act out. They're more likely um, to be uh, suspended, to, to um, have juvenile uh, delinquency as well as criminal behavior later in life. Um, but we know what the science does also show is that we, we can change this. We, we know what to do. Um, with early childhood education programs, with um, uh, opportunities like paid parental leave that promote family economic security, we can change those tra trajectories. We just have to start very early. So, so let's do this. It's interesting. You mentioned we know what to do. And I'm not sure that there's total agreement on this, but in terms of the book's main messages, if I have this wrong, you'll tell me. Universal paid parental leave. Universal. Across the board. High quality infant, toddler, child care, and education. But let me ask you this. What specifically in the state of New Jersey would that mean in terms of public policy, A and B, the fiscal investment, because you also seem to be paying, you're saying that we're going to pay either way. It depends upon how and when. What would that mean in New Jersey in terms of public policy? Um, so, uh, I mean, New Jersey is, is a leader in early childhood. And I know we have uh, you know, many people who have been working on these issues for, for decades on behalf of, of children here. Um, and so New Jersey already has paid parental leave. Uh, there's, there's low take up, and, and I know there's been a push to expand it. Um, most states don't. So, um, so uh, there's a lot of opportunity in other states to expand that. Um, then um, New Jersey also has preschool, um, 42 states, including New Jersey, and then also the District of Columbia have some sort of public preschool. Eight states don't, um, but they vary widely in quality and, and access with very few kids on average actually accessing um, public preschool, and especially high quality preschool. And then in the middle, families have to um, work within a, a child care subsidy system that it has long wait lists and really is most of the time does not pay for what infant, high quality infant or toddler child care actually costs. You know, uh, I'm sure, I'm, as was mentioned, I'm preaching to the choir here, but families spend on, on average about 11% of their incomes on child care. 11%. 11%. And low income families spend 22%. And that's just what they spent. The vast majority of childcare they're purchasing is of mediocre quality. If they actually were buying high quality childcare, it'd be much, much higher. So they need more financial assistance. Uh, Dr. Chaudhary, let me, let me ask you this before we open it up to the rest of the group. On the federal level, given the current climate in Washington, which I'm sure no one wants to talk about this early in the morning, Given the recommendations in the book as it relates to what the role of the federal government is in terms of public policy as well as in terms of spending, what are the odds, what are the chances, you're, you're, you're smiling already, Dr. Morrissey, what are the chances that there's a meaningful discussion about what needs to be done and that what you propose in the book, Cradle to Kindergarten, would be taken seriously by those in the White House 
who are responsible for these issues, as well as those who are in control of both houses of Congress, which last time I checked is how these things would be done other than the judicial branch getting involved. Please share. Sure. Um, so yes, I'll be honest, in the current world, where uh, so many of the values that um, I cherish, probably many people in this room cherish about what makes, uh, what's made America the great country it is, the fact that um, immigrants um, have built this country, that people have come from with very little from diverse parts of the world to form uh, a union um, of, uh, that uh, it became uh, the most educated uh, country in the world by the early part of the 20th century um, and sort of has given up that uh, position uh, by the end of the 20th century. Um, uh, it, it, uh, it, uh, it's hard to look up and say, oh yes, I see this happening today. But I do see this happening. Uh, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's, it's hard in those moments to forget that this is sort of a nation that was uh, built um, or founded on the idea that all are created equal and endowed with inalienable rights to pursue the ability to reach their full potential. Um, we were the first country in the world, um, and it wasn't from Washington that established primary schooling um, for its citizenry. And it was, was actually- Was from the state? It was from the states. It was, one pla it was place by place. Um, to the point where it happened rapidly. We were the first nation in the world. I mean, we established the idea that free universal public education can support the development of a country and support its economy. That became, that became proof to the rest of the world who all then, when they had the opportunity to do that, this is now accepted everywhere, that the only way to build an economy is to educate your citizenry. Is this a state-by-state -state fight? I think it's a, I think Realistically, it's a, is it? I think it, at the start. I think right now what we need is we need a few places in the country to build cradle to kindergarten, to show how it Give would work. Give me the three, three keys to cradle to kindergarten. In New Jersey, going beyond where we are today, we would do these three things. What would they be? We would establish paid leave that most, that most newborn parents with newborns would take up. So it would have to be more generous, higher take up, better advertised um, to families. We would um, support families' financial costs for childcare through a combination of more generous refundable tax credits mm. and, um, and, and more generous subsidies. And we would provide universal preschool to low-income and middle-class children um, at ages three and four. Because one of the things that we make key in the book is that inequality isn't a question of the top versus the bottom, which is often how we sort of see it. Middle class kids are the ones who've actually fallen further behind high income kids in the last 40 years. It's in part because high income kids, families can buy the, the child care and preschool experiences that their families need. And for some, a fraction of low income kids, they get support from public programs. But the, but the cost that Taryn laid out, that sort of 11 to 22 percent is not something that two working parents making $40,000 each can pay. We start the book with the stories of sort of two families, right. one in uh, Washington State and one in New York City, who, who they're not poor. They each, the, the, both families make $75,000, $80,000 a year. But at $75,000, $80,000 a year with a newborn or even one kid or two kids, you can't afford to put them in high quality preschool. What we need is a system that really is universal and so, doesn't have holes in it. Let, let me do this. My job, as you may know, and, and seal knows this because we've been doing this for a few years. My job is not to advocate. My job is to play devil's advocate, if you will. My job is to raise uh, what I believe to be the appropriate questions um, to stimulate conversation. So in that spirit, are you aware of the fact that New Jersey has, according to some, no money? <laughs> are you aware that New Jersey has just about the worst public employee pension crisis, upwards of $80 billion of an unfunded liability and concerned deeply about the ability to um, keep the commitments for public employees who will be retiring. The fact that there's a discussion about um, free community college uh, that has been proposed by our new governor, Governor Phil Murphy, 
uh, a fully funding of the New Jersey state law as it relates to public schools, state funding to public schools. Uh, dare I push the issue a little further, that the new federal tax laws allow for those of us who play, pay the highest property taxes in the nation will only now be able to deduct $10,000, the first $10,000 of our property taxes. Um, in addition to that, we'll no longer be able to, as I understand it, on our state income tax, which is considerable, and a whole range of other uh, issues. And by the way, by 1947 Constitution, New Jersey cannot engage in deficit spending. So the question's obvious. Where would this money come from? And what should it come from? Doctor. Uh, <laughs> give me the easy question. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I'll be asking this tomorrow as well. I just want to give everyone a heads up. Go ahead. I think uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And I, um, uh, I, I will punt a little. In don't, that. Don't, I don't punt. I don't, well, I don't the know. The Super that. Bowl's next week. Don't punt right now. <laughs> um, I think it's a choice of now or later. Make that case. So you, you invest now in early childhood development. You get kids ready to learn in kindergarten. You spend less in K through 12 education. You spend less uh, with remedial uh, education. You um, spend less on criminal justice. And you get more in terms of later income taxes, in, in terms of having people prepared for the jobs that are being created, the jobs that will be around in 20 years. Uh, it's service. Um, low-wage, um, you know, unskilled jobs are, are going away. They're, they're being automated. Our economy is changing. But that's what we're preparing children for. Uh, arguably, the, uh, more than half of, of U.S. children are only prepared for that level. And that's a problem. And we know that um, our, our, uh, what we're producing is not matching the, the um, skills out there. But so it's, it's not a question of whether to invest in kids. It's just a question of, of when. Are we going to spend it on, on jails in the criminal justice system, or are we going to spend it on promoting our next generation of citizens? Sure. By the way, tomorrow, joining us in our forum, our Right From the Start NJ forum, and by the way, please, once again, um, follow us. Look at that site and, and follow us uh, on Twitter and like us on Facebook. I won't say that more than three times. But tomorrow we'll be joined by uh, State Senator Joseph Vitale, who is one of the lead members of the legislature and, and still has been working with uh, Senator Vitale for years. And he will be talking about the environment uh, in the State House today and the appetite, if you will, for such a discussion and for the policy decisions that have to be made. It's the perfect time to bring in our panel. I'm going to ask each panelist, Karen, I'm going to start with you, tell everyone who you are and just 30 seconds or less about your organization so we put things in context. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Karen White. I am the Director of Working Families Programs, excuse me, at the Center for Women and Work at Rutgers University. The Center for Women and Work uh, looks at workplace policies and practices through a gender lens. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on paid family leave, um, minimum wage, which is a women's issue as much as it is anything else, uh, fair scheduling, and a host of other issues, policy issues, both here in New Jersey and nationally. Thank you. Beverly. Good morning. My name is Beverly Lynn, Chief Executive Officer for Programs for Parents. Programs for Parents is a child care resource and referral agency in Essex County. And we provide uh, child care subsidies for families, about 10,000 families per month in Essex, uh, as well as professional development and a host of other services and resources for parents and early childhood professionals. Our mission is to help children get the best start in life, and we take that very seriously. Well said. Dr. Friede has, been, has joined us on countless occasions on public television and has added so much to the discourse, and um, and ask you to introduce yourself, Ellen. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm Ellen Friedy. I'm a senior co-director at the National Institute for Early Education Research, which is at Rutgers University, and um, 
at NEAR, uh, we produced the State of Pre-K yearbook that Taryn was just uh, quoting statistics from about how many states have preschool and how many don't. And But we also do a lot of other kinds of research to inform public policy around the full range of early childhood, but with a fulcrum at, at preschool. Um, and uh, we also do research to inform policy around practice. So what kind of policies do you have to improve practice, um, both at the local and state and national level? Thank you. Bonnie, a little bit about your organization, and uh, we'll talk about Head Start and the fight in just a minute. Okay. Um, my name is Bonnie Agenberg. I am the president for the New Jersey Head Start Association. I'm also uh, the vice president for Gateway Head Start, one of uh, 26 uh, grantees offering Early Head Start, Head Start, and Early Head Start Child Care Partnership services throughout the state. Um, our organization is focused on uh, advocacy for young children as well as professional development for uh, Head Start and Early Head Start throughout the state. And I do want to say thank you to Taryn because a lot of the data that she has shared only goes to uh, point to the success of Head Start programs throughout the nation. Well said. So Taryn and AJ, and by the way, we'll open this up to, to the rest of the choir, if you will, the folks who are uh, been in the trenches every day uh, fighting the good fight in just a, a moment. But I'm going to ask, where do you agree and where do you disagree on the primary tenets of this book as has been stated by the two co-authors? Doctor, where do you agree? Where, where are they right? Um, I think pretty much everywhere. I'm sorry. I, I'm not usually a real kind of gung-ho. Pretty much everywhere. <laughs> AJ just went like this. That was good. Um, I, um, I, 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 I mean, there are some little tiny things that I disagree with, particularly in the chapter about preschool, but just in the way that it's descri they're described more than in the, the basic issue. Um, having been a preschool teacher and a preschool program administrator, there's some issues around curriculum. I don't agree with the way they, they describe it, but, but I believe in universal preschool. Um, I, I, I have for a long time. I think it's a matter of, of it, what's best for children. You, you talked about the issue of, of Failure and inequity is, is not just for the lowest income, it's also for the middle income. And so we, we need that kind of support um, for children in, during, those, uh, uh, during, during that, that age range. Um, it's also uh, a matter of justice. Uh, and and um, so it's both a developmental argument and a, and a justice argument. And it's also a, a, a tactical argument we're not going to serve the lowest income and the and the children the most needy children unless we're serving all the children it's just really clear we've been tinkering around the edges for 50 years since head start was started and we've never served the targeted kids that head start intended um, to 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 serve the full target and so i did want to just add that um, not only was public school fast to catch on, but kindergarten over a 15 year period in the middle of the last century went from 35% um, to over 80%. And that's the kind of thing we can do in preschool with universal pre-K if we, if we get it, if we get the ball rolling. Karen, let me ask you, you know Trenton, you know the State House pretty well. Do you think my description of the mood, the appetite, the climate, was accurate or unnecessarily pessimistic? Of New Jersey? Of New Jersey's, the policymakers, right. the politicians, elected officials in both houses of the legislature together with the new governor, as progressive as he may be, as open as he may be, but I'm talking about the fiscal realities in the state. Do you believe it is as bleak as I described in terms of responding to some of the state initiatives in terms of where it can be happen on the state level? So I, I think that um, it is bleak. Um, I think that it was bleaker under the previous administration and that this administration has some um, innovative and progressive ways of uh, identifying revenue opportunities and sees the um, economy in a different way that can um, hopefully move it forward. So, so this, you, you see F Governor Murphy being more inclined to be receptive to some of the uh, themes in the book? 
Absolutely. Well, let, let me ask you this. Again, devil's advocate. What do you say to those who argue? Okay, well, we need more funding to do this, even if it's not all of it, it's some of it, to fund a lot of the other progressive initiatives that help those who have the least ability to help themselves. And one of the ways we're going to do that is increase taxes on wealthier New Jerseyans. What do you say, Bonnie, to those who argue, yeah, okay, but here's the catch. And someone might say, why are you bringing this up? It's because it's a fiscal reality. What do you say to some of those who say, you know what? Even those who may agree with what you're saying and want to be helpful to those who have the least ability to help themselves, that those who are taxed at the higher level, who have the ability to leave the state, will leave the state, we lose that revenue, and then that fiscal conundrum continues. Can we simply raise more revenue from those who are wealthier in the state to do some of the things that are talked about in the book, from your view? I'm certainly not an economics expert, so to comment on, on the uh, wealthy leaving the state, uh, um, I would have a hard time doing that. But what I would say to those who are in the wealthy uh, bracket is that if we look at a comprehensive mixed delivery system that emphasizes the importance of Head Start being part of a universal pre-K system, then it's not just the state that is bringing uh, funding to the table, but it is also the federal uh, government bringing funding to the table to make it an effective system. Whether they like it or not? Whether? The federal government likes it or not? Are you saying that's somehow mandated, that there's a formula that makes that happen? Head Start is a federally funded program. And one of the reasons that Abbott has been successful is because Head Start has been so well integrated into the Abbott uh, program. And um, even in this last round of funding, Head Start programs have been part of that mixed delivery system to offer preschool programming in the state of New Jersey and has been very helpful to some of the districts who are very new to the early childhood world. And we know that Head Start is effective. We know that the comprehensive services are what families who are at risk need. Well, by the way, you know what's so interesting? There are some who argued that the $25 million that was set aside <clears throat> for pre-K in New Jersey, that that would never have happened, right? So in the spirit of really playing devil's advocate, I would have bet against it. I would have said, nah, that'll never happen in New Jersey. It happened. And that happened with a previous administration, which by any reasonable standard, you would say that the new administration would seem to be more open to what's being said. Yes, Doctor, and I'll bring you in, Beverly, yes. So on the question about whether a higher taxation could be tolerated and whether- For would, some of these initiatives. For, for the, for I don't the, want to get into a broader yeah, discussion. Yeah, no, no, no. Right. So, so I, I think a couple points. One, I, um, uh, the economic literature, you know, is pretty clearly, I think, shows that um, there, is not, um, there is not as much movement um, when tax rates go up. Um, at the high end as, uh, as some people would claim. So for example, California, Massachusetts, New York all have higher taxes at the top end than, than New Jersey does. And, and when they did those, right. there wasn't any sort of mass exodus. The other part of it is- oh, wait, Before you go any further, the new federal tax law, which limits our ability to deduct, to to still that. no impact? No, well, we'll see. We'll Go see ahead. about that. But what I would say is the new federal tax law, as awful as it is um, and um, as, as punishing as it is of high tax states and particularly uh, northeast and uh, west coast states, um, does present the opportunity to sort of rethink our – there's going to be some rethinking of what taxes at the state level should be. Hmm. And you could think about – and, you know, including potentially shifting to an employer-based um, payroll tax instead of income taxes in order to sort of at least um, not capture that. There's been some talk about creating trusts for certain areas in which you could create tax deductible that you can deduct. Including from, some of the things you're right, talking about. Right. You could create a cradle to kindergarten trust. A, right? cra a, what? a cradle to kindergarten trust, kindergarten trust in New Jersey, which would? To offset some of your taxes, you could provide that and that would become a federal tax deduction. Um, so I could opt in. I want to be a part of that. I want to fund that. I right. want to support the families, those children who had what our kids had. Right, exactly. And then the other part of it, which is what you're coming to now, is what is it? What is the state? It's not just what do I have to pay to be in the state, but what do I want my state to do? 
Huh. What do I want to be? I mean, it's, you know, why was New Jersey the second state ever to establish paid leave? I would have never guessed that, you know, after California, it was the second state What kind state of state ever. do we want? Right. Do we want a state where every, every family gets um, 12 weeks to bond and create a safe and a, a, a thoughtful um, plan to raising their kid? Um, that's, that's, that's an amenity um, in many ways for where you live. Um, and so, Interesting. you know, you can imagine that people would say, no, I'm not going to move to Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania doesn't offer me that. I mean, you want working parents or Florida. in your state. Right. Or Florida. Right. Even if it's a better tax rate. Right. It's not you, the kind of state I yeah. want to live in. You don't want Florida schools. Even if you're paying a ton here for New Jersey schools, if you're, if you're a parent, you don't want Florida schools. They don't do, they don't produce. Um, and you, and you, By the way, and, anyway, we hear from, f no, we're good. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. No, but I mean, it's, uh, um, no, so, so well you, 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 could, you could basically say, you know, where do you want the hardworking, well-earning working right. families um, to, to feel that they have a structure that supports the raising of their kids and all all kids in their state. And where do you see the uh, the economy growing? You know, who's going to win the race for um, jobs in the future? Well said. Jump in, and then I'll bring you in. Sure. I just want to say I'll put on my parent hat. I have a one and a half year old and a three and a half year old. The District of Columbia has has a universal preschool for threes and fours. I love it. My son goes to public preschool. My daughter will. It is. Um, it is an asset. The families in, in our community love it. And so it makes me proud to, to be a DC resident and, and now and we'll soon have paid leave. So um, I think it is an, an asset. So DC has it. That's correct. I was going to say, it, it is the only place in the country that has That it. has universal for threes and fours. Yeah. Ms. Lynn, jump in here. By the way, is there any aspect of the book that you disagree with? Well, there are a few things, but let me just first say that I you, think... You want to get to the disagreements later? <laughs> One second. Ahead. That this is a bold approach. And when you want to see change and you want to really transform an industry, you have to be bold. So I thank you for stepping out and, and not only bold, but you've incorporated all of the aspects of what we already do. The CCDBG is already in there, Head Start's in there, Pre-K's in there, and we know there's opportunity for more leveraging uh, of those federal resources as this, you know, if we begin to incorporate this. Where, Where they missed the mark? Um, I believe that there should be skin in the game, but $10 a week for parents who are 100% of the federal poverty level or lower, I don't think that's doable. Try, try that again. For everyone so in the book, they're asking that all parents pay a copay. That all parents pay a copay. Right. And if you are at 100% of the federal poverty level or below, your copay should be around $10 a week. You say? I'm saying that a parent that's a TANF parent is only getting $322 a month for a parent and child. If they're paying $40 of the $322 a month for childcare co-payment, that leaves them very little. $10 on top of that? No, $10 as a co-pay. So they're, they're okay. going to get a subsidy, but they have to pay towards it. They just want to have skin in the game. And what I find, and, I, and I've experienced this in the past, where uh, parents were asked to pay a copay, one dollar. One dollar made the difference between a parent who was, oh, I'll bring them when I want, and I, you know, very casual about the care, to now, I'm paying for this. Skin, Skin in, in the game. Skin in the game. So while I disagree with the dollar amount, I, d I agree with the principle. Well said. Uh, you shaking your head, doctor? Yeah, I, well, I, 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 I think that's really um, an, an important point about, about motivation because we found in the Abbott Preschool Program, which is our flagship program in New Jersey, that, um, that when we had free wraparound, we wasted a lot of money. <laughs> and I still think it's the right thing. We just needed to fix the implementation rather than take it away. A wraparound, by the way, meaning we, children were eligible regardless of their income for before and after care and summer care. Um, and um, it was the right policy. It was just we needed to fix the implementation Is the of $10 it. $10 copay the right number in your mind? Oh, I agree with Beverly. I it's think, too high. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Bonnie yeah. says, yes, too high. It's too high. We operate four child care centers, and where we have working families, we have high attendance. Um, the reason the RAP didn't work is the parents weren't required to work, so they 
didn't have that incentive. A job in and of itself is incentive to bring your child on a daily basis. Um, and the average family living in poverty has three children in their household. And many times those three children are under the age of five. So now we're asking them to spend $30 a week, $120 a month. No, no, it's $10 it's per caps. family. To, yeah. The it's book caps. says 10, by ch uh, 10 per child, so. No, it's, it's, for, for, it's for the so, family. To clarify that, okay. is, is it accurate to say it's $10 per family or $10 for each child in that family? Let's be clear. $10 per family. Okay. That's, gets closer, but again, $40 a month. I have now children that I have to have diapers for, which none of the outside help that I might get, I might be on SNAP, I might be on WIC, and I've got a paycheck coming in. All of these miscellaneous expenses for a rapidly growing child, a copay for a family living at 100% or poverty level or lower, it's not, it doesn't work for them. Um, and my experience is that those at that 100% of poverty level or lower who are working, they bring their children. Let me, sure. l l l let me clarify a, a little and respond, because not everyone's had a chance to read the book yet, um, but I'm glad everybody got a copy that's very generous of, of ACNJ and Nicholson. Thank you for that. Um, in the book, we call, we have four pillars and policies that we promote. Paid leave, which we've talked a little bit about, child care subsidies, um, uh, universal free preschool, so I want to make clear that preschool for three and four-year-olds is free, and a re revamped Head Start um, that would be focused on birth to school entry. If school entry ends up being three, then it would be from prenatal to three. If it ends up, if it's wherever it's four, it'd be prenatal to four. Wherever it's five, it'd be prenatal to five. And there's also no copay for Head Start. Um, what we provide the copay, which there is copays now, um, and it, in many places the minimum is higher than $10, is the idea that if you're, and this, so this would mostly affect working parents. So, um, because we also have free Head Start um, in places of concentrated poverty. So areas of uh, where mm -hmm. more, more families are poor, it would still be free services. Um, but the, the idea is, as um, Beverly pointed out, that there is lots of evidence that parents making even a minimal contribution increases attendance. Um, there is issues with attendance in free preschool in some places, particularly for poor families, not non-working families, and and you would only and so and the and the copay just to be clear, it's it's ten dollars is the minimum. It's between three and ten percent of family income because we go all the way up to sixty thousand dollars a year getting subsidies uh, as a national floor, but at state option it could go up to. $100,000 a year. So at $100,000 a year, we want to we want to sort of make this clear that there's a there's a shared responsibility across families, governments, and states, and that your copay varies with your income. And when you make more, you'll be able to pay more. But the least that everyone we we say is 10. I mean, we're obviously able to negotiate to make it five, but we really feel that um, the least is 10. Yeah. By the way, I, uh, Bonnie, let me do this. Um, I remember when I was doing my doctoral work at Rutgers in communication, we studied nonverbal communication. And when someone goes like this, <laughs> um, I could you be wrong, but as I remember that, my, my research, that that meant that they didn't agree. And, and Bonnie, you were doing this, and you're terrible at poker. I <laughs> and, and the reason you were shaking your head, just to clarify, I don't want to assume sure. is? Um, the, uh, the idea that um, pre-K should be solely the responsible of, of the educational system, I think, um, do, does our population, our families living in poverty, a huge disservice. Uh, there are studies out there that show that um, a traditional approach is not going to be effective when working with a diverse population, um, diverse cultures, as well as diverse needs. That's where Head Start excels, and there much, there's much research out there that shows that Head Start works to break the intergenerational poverty cycle, um, that the children of Head Start children are much more likely to uh, earn a higher income um, than had their parents not been a Head Start child. Um, Head Start children are more likely to um, have a stable home um, as opposed to a child who is in an early childhood classroom or a childcare classroom. Um, the 
for an at-risk family, uh, they're more likely to end up in foster care if they're not in Head Start. This, this copay issue is a big deal for you? Copay issue is also a big deal for me because right now in the state of New Jersey, if I'm at 100% of poverty level or lower, I don't pay a copay. Got it. Let's do this. Let's open it up for questions, comments, feedback. Let's have a spirited dialogue amongst the folks who deal with these issues every day, who care most about those um, children and the families that we're talking about. Put your hand up. Let's have a conversation. I, otherwise, I'll just start calling on people. <laughs> Jordan, let me ask you, tell folks who you are. By the way, you're joining us in our forum tomorrow, uh, representing the great Montclair State University. Jordan, what question do you have? What comment do you want to make about this book itself and um, the direction we need to go in. Tell everyone who you are, by the way. I'm Gary Costner. I'm the director of the Center for Autism and Early Childhood Mental Health at Montclair Jerry, I'll help you with this. Go ahead. Oh, good. Oh, thanks. Don't and take it. I'm just all right. OK. Just... <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. I'm and, no, I know. And Caitlin Mulcahy is our associate director, and she'll be on the panel tomorrow. So I just received the book today, so I have to say I haven't read it yet. But from what you heard. Yeah, from what I heard. So I think the, um, I find little to disagree with. I love the skin in the game notion, and I think it's important. Um, and in my career, I've been a Head Start director and uh, worked in early intervention for many years, but I'm an infant mental health specialist and developmental psychologist, so I really work on the mental health end but I also work on the professional development end, professional formation. And what I look forward to uh, in reading in the book is investing in the relationship-based care that infants and toddlers and children need because the more traditional perspective, which is often focused on educational outcomes, can sometimes bypass the way in which infants and, and toddlers and preschoolers are experiencing a sense of who they are. So by the way, uh, what Steve said about nonverbal behavior, uh, it turns out that probably in the first two years of life, our right brain systems and our subcortical systems are much more online than our left brain. And so for the first two to three years of life, if we don't help those early caregivers mm. really understand how their affect and gestures and movement and pacing and intonation are important. So I guess what I would love to see, and it might be in the book, but if not, I'd love it to be part of the discourse, is how do we really impart the kinds of people we really need to help mm. infants and toddlers grow? Well said, by the way, the book talks about health implications, talks about um, um, implications as it relates to educational success, uh, societal success, um, the ability to interact and relate, as you said, draw to, to other folks. It, are, we, um, are we missing the, any of the other byproducts of the inequities that are described so effectively in the book? Doctor? Um, well, I. I uh... We believe that it would, so I think the main ones have been brought up. So we think it would reduce the use of special education. It would reduce uh, um, uh, grade retention. It would reduce, it would increase the number of the percentage of uh, kids going on to college and completing college and being ready and employed in the workforce. It would, it would, it would improve health outcomes. This is, you know, from research and it would reduce um, crime and recidivism, which is probably the biggest cost savings to the state. That's, you, ha yeah, you have to really believe. Prison costs are huge. Right, those costs are huge. Um, and the, to the degree that people are able to um, develop the skills to support themselves, the less likely we're to see um, crime in young adulthood, which is the period in which um, it occurs. Beverly, and then I'm coming back to you, CLA. Yeah, question. I just yes. want to say a little bit about high quality, because all of this is based on providing high quality care, birth through age, uh, to kindergarten. So on your point, Jerry, I think um, the book talks about high quality from the perspective of quality rating improvement systems and uh, some of the work that's already be, been done through Child Care Development Block Grant and so forth. And I think here in New Jersey, we have a lot to build on. However, um, it is more focused on pre-K. Mm -hmm. That's my perspective. Uh, As opposed to, to the first Jersey. three years. Yes. Yeah, as opposed to the first three years, because I think um, one of the things that we don't talk enough about is about how do we get our babies 
from one place, from, from where they are right here up to that age three, so they're ready why, why for Why do we miss that, Beverly? Um, We're not focused on it enough. Well, we've been so focused on pre-K, I think, hey, over hey, the years. Hey, let's get that pre-K thing. Let's get that pre-K thing. And we're still fighting for pre-K. We want every three and four-year-old to have pre-K, access to high-quality pre-K. But? But we have to give a lot more attention to the birth to three-year-old population. And a um, lot more funding. Can, can I just... Yes. I, and the last chapter in the book is called No More Tinkering Around the Edges. No and more tinkering around the edges. Go ahead. <laughs> that gets applause, no more tinkering yeah. around the edges. I mean, it's, the, it, it's my favorite chapter. I told the authors that. Because, and I've been saying this for a long time, no more pilot programs. In, in New Jersey, we have a robust and high-quality program that serves that serves. 20% of the three and four year olds in the state. It's tinkering around the edges and it's one of the better programs with, across the United States. So, so I think that, that the point about infant, it's, it's a both and, it's not an either or and we should not be put in, in you know, Sophie's choice and having to choose between children. It, it, I'm sorry. Doesn't happen. That's, by the way, see, <laughs> I see a lot of hands that just went up. I'll come to you, Karen, in a second. So let me ask you, you were part of the $25 million pre-K fight. You understand the way that fight played out. You understand the forces who were not so inclined in the spirit of playing devil's advocate as opposed to what I really think the policy should be, which is not my role as a broadcaster with PBS. To what degree do you believe after that happened last year, is there an appetite for the discussion that's being talked about here from birth to three? Hey. I know we did that other thing, but this really matters. To what degree do you think there is the appetite for it, and who do you think is ready to come to the table? I do think there's an appetite for it. I think we're in a different environment, a different climate. Um, I don't think we've done the job on preschool. I agree with Ellen. We all know that our state has had a law in place since 2008 that's never been funded that would have expanded right. preschool to more children. Um, it was but a law. Yes, it we is in the it. law. So almost 10 years later, I guess my question is how long do we wait for that to be in place before we look at birth to three? What do you think strategically makes sense? Well, what intrigued me the most about this book was that it lays out a comprehensive agenda. It doesn't say pick and choose. It says you have to do it all. Um, and I understand the fiscal environment, but I think the investment argument has been made for each one of these issues, for family leave, for early Head Start and Head Start, for preschool, for high quality childcare. It's one system and we should look at it that way. You know, I think three things came together for me when, we, when I first read this, this book. One is that we had just become involved in Right From The Start. That's right. So for an organization that's focused considerable advocacy on preschool, this was an opportunity to look at what do kids need from birth to three. And it's a much bigger agenda. I think you get into the area of society saying, hey, wait a minute, that's a parent responsibility. I think we have the same argument to make that we did for preschool that it is education. The other thing was that we were doing focus groups across the state with parents at the time. So we were in a group in Trenton, which is the one that had the most impact on me, talking to low-income parents who knew they were choosing childcare that was not good for their kids and in some cases not safe for their kids. That's what was available. What was available because they had to work. And when we listened to those parents, they knew what they wanted for their kids. They want what we all want for our kids. They just couldn't get it. And when you when this book was framed as a new plan to combat inequality, I listened to that group and thought, we're talking about right from the start. This is inequality right from the start. Well said. Carrie, I see you. Uh, start, your con start what you're going to say, and I'll come around with the mic. T Carrie, t tell everyone who you are. Hi, everyone. I'm Carrie lagosa Wizarel. I'm the executive director of Greater Newark Health Coalition. And I've been part of whole effort oh thank you Steve right, sure. in this whole effort because of the brain science research and what we know about what's going on prenatally and how it matters the nine months to save the world that I learned through Jerry's um, great work and partnerships 
and think about it as healthy brain development, which has been said, so I'm so happy. But what are, what's the skin in the game of the healthcare sector, the healthcare insurance companies and all of these other partners? And I think coalitions like Greater Newark, and there's, some, there's one in Trenton, there's one in Camden, we can be helpful conveners and facilitators of that sector right. as part of this. And I also, um, there's some news now in that Camden used to be the only community in New Jersey that was bringing in federal dollars and through something called the Promise Neighborhood. And Newark, the press release isn't even out yet, so you'll be on the hopefully the distribution list. But Newark South Ward neighborhood just found out that it got $30 million over five years to be a Promise Neighborhood. That's an opportunity, right, for part of this work to ignite and test some strategies in a neighborhood approach. I, I'm with everyone. We want a statewide solution, sometimes you have to do these parallel tracks. Are you saying take it where you can get it? I think we can test where, where you know, laboratory approach, test some things where there's already momentum. Yeah, but the pilot thing, oh, devil's advocate, again, you, you're non -stead, but the whole thing about comprehensive, what Seal I just did. said, the comprehensive approach versus uh, another pilot project, really? No, it shouldn't be a pilot project. I think it should be, we are in the fight together for the comprehensive approach and committed to where there's already momentum and dollars. They're not mutually exclusive. They're not mutually exclusive. Doctor, jump yep. back in, yes. Yep. Um, and so I want to jump back in on that and a couple of other things that sort of came in. So our Head Start proposal, in fact, is what you're saying. Um, so one of the things that we did is we said, we need a comprehensive approach, something that meets the needs of all US children. Um, and has major pillars of support that look the same and all families can count on them from day one. Um, and that includes paid leave and universal preschool. Then we have childcare, which is designed for working families. So when you're working, you have families. And so, and in the issue about birth to three and, um, uh, birth and uh, three to five, we make, we make clear in our plan that the largest gaps occur birth to three. And in fact, um, uh, the majority of our spending in our plan comes for children birth to three and that the largest issues around quality and the supporting a workforce in which you can have the relational kind of quality um, interactions um, are especially needed in birth to three. Um, but our Head Start plan is the fourth pillar of our plan and that is a neighborhood-based approach. We basically would change Head Start's eligibility to move away from um, individual income to be around neighborhood indicators of poverty and particular needs. So all families who interact with foster care, all families um, in which there's any um, claims of domestic violence would be automatically eligible, and all families with a certain poverty level, every child born into that community would be um, level. Because one's own poverty isn't the only thing that sort of affects your developmental outcomes, it's the children around you. And we make a conscious effort to sort of say, what should a Head Start be in the 21st century in the context of also having universal preschool. And those are precious dollars. We in fact double them, right? But we say that the, a Head Start today has to start um, even before a kid is born. That just like we knew, given what we know now about the brain's development, if we knew that in 1965, we would have designed it that way then. Um, and so, and similarly, if we knew in 1935 that when Social Security was developed, that 75% um, that of moms would be working. We didn't know that we, then, right. we know it we, now. We, we, would have covered the, we would have covered birth in the same way we cover retirement and disability. It's, so we can't, so one thing is we have to update these programs for the needs of our time. Based on the research, the data, what we know. Yeah. AJ, stay right there. Arturo, you did not do yourself justice. And by the way, read, if you have not already, the op-ed piece that you co-wrote, um, starledgernj.com, you also, Folks may not know your background, by the way. Real quick on that, but also the brain development piece. What we know, birth and prenatal to three that is relevant to this discussion, Artur. Sure, yeah, so it's, I mean, I'll just give some quick 30,000 foot uh, view of, of the brain development. The brain between birth uh, and- How do you know these things so people know? I think I said I'm, I'm a pediatrician and I've- Okay. A community pediatrician and I'm, I'm with a public health background. Can't help yeah. anyone. All right. <laughs> In a different way. Um, you're helping me right now. Um, so between birth and two years of age, as an example, the brain triples in, in weight. By the time a child is two years old, uh, the brain size is 80% of the adult brain size. 80%. 80%. And what's really important here is that the, uh, the connections between the brain cells okay, are being formed at such a rapid pace in those first few years of life. And if they're not stimulated, 
at some point they start to go away, basically, is the easiest way of saying it. Um, so it's really critical perinatally in their first few years of life to have the right stimulation for the brain. Um, so that's, that's the 30,000 foot. I actually had a, a point to make based on something, Dr. Morris, if you, if you don't mind. You know, I was thinking, as you, Dr. Morrissey was talking about now or later, a challenge with the now or later argument, when we talk about recidivism, we talk about K to 12 savings, when we special talk ed. about special ed, even special ed, is that from a political point of view, you know, you come into office, you really have two to three years to start demonstrating that difference um, to un help the voters understand that you should be reelected. That's the reality of it. However, I think there's some arguments that you can get some quicker, demonstrate some quicker gains. So I have a question for the authors or anybody else that knows about the evidence on this. But the early intervention program is a good example. The early intervention program in the state of New Jersey is costing the state upwards of $100 million, and it keeps increasing because of increased referrals in spite of the fact that the uh, referral quality has improved, meaning kids should be referred, and the intensity of the attention given to these children. And this is in spite of a flat birth rate for the last decade in the state. Well, I truly believe that if you start this process a lot earlier, you're not going to need as many referrals to early intervention, or when you do, the intensity won't be as much because that brain will be stimulated, parents will know how to stimulate, child care providers will know how to stimulate their children, and therefore you can actually have relatively, you know, in a, in a year or two, you start to see a downward trend. So I'm curious if you've seen that. And the other quick gain is going to be a lot of parents, because of inability to get quality child care uh, education, places they can trust to leave their children at, and know that they're going to do as good a job as they would at home, Parents, opt, one of the parents, often the mother, will opt not to work. So the other quick gain is that you're going to actually increase, in the short term, people in the workforce. So I'm just curious what the authors in particular, and Dr. Morrissey looks like she has a response so, so to this. It's interesting you laid out. Um, Arturo is actually laying out, and I see the other hands up, is making the argument that the argument, the sell, could and should be different then pay now or pay later. It's an investment as opposed to paying for the prison costs, et cetera, et cetera. Your response? Sure. I, I think it's, it, again, it's not an either or. I think it's pay now and pay later is what we're doing because of um, the early intervention. We do know that, um, that high quality early childhood education reduces uh, special ed referrals. And I don't know an exact study on early intervention per se, but I'd imagine there's a, there's a pretty big decrease. I mean, there's, it benefits kids. It, 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 it's something like early childhood education benefits all children, but it benefits the most disadvantaged the most, and that's that's key. Um, so it raises all boats, but especially those who are most vulnerable. Um, I'd also say with the the um, that childcare is a two generation uh, intervention, um, and so we you know we focus on the child development argument in this book, but we do also mention it's it's a workforce support. You know, if, if my childcare falls through, I don't get to work. Just like if transportation falls through, I don't get to work. It's an infrastructure piece. And so you invest immediately and you get immediate results in terms of, of um, increased labor force attachment. For, for paid leave, for example, we know that moms in particular who take paid leave are more likely to return to their jobs and stay at their jobs. Um, they're more attached to the workforce. It promotes economic in stability in the family as well as employment stability. By the way, Karen, I, we haven't heard from you in a while. Comment on what you've heard so far and then I'll come back. What have we missed? <clears throat> So I think that all of uh, it's been a great conversation so far. Yeah, I'm um, very good at this. And <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay. Go ahead. I um, I just want to you know my area is paid uh, leave um, and family leave creates a foundation. I think that's the most important. Um, creates a foundation that the family um, builds on uh, for for creating that good environment that that environment that uh, the mother and the child and the uh, the, the parents are able yeah, to. Yeah, the dad too, right? I just want to make yes, sure that the. I, I want to, yes, the parents want to make sure. are able to, um, to both bond, get well baby care, be able to breastfeed, um, uh, all the things that create that nurturing environment and that ability to um, put the child in, in the, on the right sure. track. 
Let me just say, Arturo, can help me on this, clarify this for me. I was talking before about our children, um, and Seal knows the Montclair uh, program that, in fact, had such a great impact on all of our children um, in those early years. But I'm particularly struck by brain development. Our daughter, Olivia, is seven. That's so right, we actually have a seven-year-old and 25-year-old in there, and two teenagers. Um, two, I've been divorced, but that's not relevant. Um, <laughs> But what I'm struck by is our seven-year-old Olivia, and she was, I mean, she had the best childcare, um, the best educational opportunities. Is it also a fact that seven-year-old girls who've had these opportunities challenge their father in ways and ask <laughs> questions that I absolutely do not have the answer to, and I wind up lying to her because I don't want to get deeper into the conversation and because she knows what the truth is. Am I on the right track here? I just want to just check in. But, and yeah, it not, it's not always helpful, but, but I, I'm, I'm sorry. Could you tell everyone who you are? I'm Blythe Heinitz, Distinguished Professor, Elementary and Early Childhood Education at the College of New Jersey. Uh, it's too bad that Hero is not here, um, one of the four authors of this book. And I wanted to mention an aspect that nobody has talked about. Hero's research deals with infants and toddlers of immigrant families and families of uh, color and families of a variety of religions. And this is um, the elephant in the room that very few people talk about, but it's a very important aspect of it because the percentage of families with infants and toddlers from those populations mm. is important to address. The other thing I wanted to say in terms of um, quality staff preparation, here at the College of New Jersey, we have a brand new five-year early childhood special ed program, um, and it's one of very few in the country, and it is an attempt to meet the needs of the early childhood special ed population as well as the general early childhood population. Well said. AJ, could you respond to that part? Sure. Even your First of all, I, I meant here. to say from the very beginning, um, that uh, we want to thank our two co-authors, Hiro Yoshikawa and Chris Wheeland, who aren't here. Um, and you're right, Hiro's book, Immigrants Raising Citizens, also a Russell Sage publication, um, uh, and I worked with him on that project, um, followed children born into New York City hospitals for their early childhood, and, identif um, and particularly Chinese and Dominican families born in New York City, um, and identifies the, partic the particular challenges and the particular benefits that are arise to immigrant families who I think people know, um, you know, 26% of all children in the United States are um, uh, children of immigrants. Um, and that without the births of children of immigrants in the U.S., the U.S. child population would have started declining in 1985. We wouldn't, we would be a declining population, but for children of immigrants. And so in states like New York and New Jersey and California, where they make up m even more of our population, they are our future. They're, they're cre giving them the ability to um, uh, thrive in the early years because um, they are our doctors and lawyers and um, professionals of the future. And so we really should be thinking about their potential in, as we think about all of this. Well said, so, um, by the way, to our other panelists, feel learning. free, you can jump in any, anyone want to comment before I go to Rush? Russell is over here. Any comments so far? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I just want to share, and I know most folks have not read the book. In the book, they talk about eliminating the family, friend, and neighbor option and encourage that population to move into becoming more licensed or regulated care. Am I correct? Well, um, partially. Um, okay. we, 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 um, we limit subsidies. Right now, in most states, child care subsidies can fund licensed or unlicensed care, um, uh, including relatives and, and neighbors. Um, on a, there's a lot of variation in child care quality. On average, we know that licensed family child care homes and licensed child care centers usually offer higher quality. Um, so we tie subsidies to licensure, so you also have some some um, regulation and health and safety aspects too. But we, uh, for families who want to use, you know, grandparents who want to use aunts and uncles, um, we expand the child and um, dependent care tax credit. We double it and we make it refundable so it actually goes to low income families, which it does not now. So th those families could still use, we still are subsidizing them, but through the tax code, not a direct subsidy. Mm -hmm. So that's an important yes, point, probably. only because there are a lot of infants and toddlers 
in family, friend, and neighbor care. So I'm just bringing that up as a topic that we might want to talk about at another time. Russ, tell everyone who you are. Uh, I'm Rush Russell, Executive Director of Prevent Child Abuse New Jersey, and many of you know we oversee efforts focused on teaching healthy and positive parenting, healthy child development, working with tens of thousands of families and parents across the state. And it really is part of the zero to three effort across the state, including home visitation programs. But I, I wanted to just say that I think there is an opportunity from an advocacy standpoint in terms of this agenda, because we're talking about kind of the moral and economic arguments that we all relate to. This is going to save money or this is what our children deserve. And, and so we're the choir. Yeah. But we've been trying that for 25 years and up against the kind of devil's advocate that sits in front of us. Uh, I, I feel like there's an opportunity and it's been mentioned how the brain science and the results from the ACE study have a chance to reframe this argument in a way. Reframe it for us now. What would it sound like in the state house? I think that the ACE study uh, has shown that children who experience early childhood trauma and increasing levels of stress face a trajectory of poor health and life outcomes, beginning with tobacco use, criminal justice involvement, mental health issues, substance use, on and on. And the higher levels of stress that they face, the higher levels of poor outcomes that we're facing that lead to premature death, chronic health outcomes, health outcomes, suicide, et cetera. And so I think, and I've, we are finding that there's more resonance to when you show pictures of a developing brain that Dr. Brito talked about and show the changes in the neuron development that happen when a child experiences something like child abuse and a healthy brain looks like a healthy spider web. It's, it's symmetrical, it's really pretty if you've seen the pictures of a developing brain. But after a, a, a case of child abuse, it looks like somebody's taken a knife and just slashed it. The, the, the connections are gone. So, so are you saying, Russ, that we have to literally paint a better, a clearer, more vivid, more powerful, compelling picture? I think we need to reframe it. I don't think that, while we all know about the ACE study, uh, I don't think that members of the New Jersey legislature know about the ACE study. There's a documentary film, and I would just be curious how many people have seen it, Resilience. And it tells the story of how other states are using the ACE study to do this reframing that has led to major reforms in the juvenile justice system, in education, in health care, et cetera. And so I, I think it's part of this agenda. So it's interesting. Rush refers to uh, child abuse. It's so interesting. You can get some folks attention when you talk about quote unquote child abuse, right? Even those who call them, I'm not going to get political here, but you can get folks attention when you refer to child abuse. Is this a form of child abuse, Bonnie? Is this a form of, oh, in terms Is of not what providing. these inequities oh, are yes. that are described in the book to frame, I'm into framing, meaning in our world, in the media communications world, if it is not framed in a fashion that most folks can relate to, understand, care about, and become engaged in, frankly, give a damn, you don't have them because there are too many other things going on. So in that spirit, I don't want to oversimplify it. Uh, is this a form, these inequities, a form of child abuse? Neglect is a form of child abuse, and we are neglecting our children in this state. Um, and, and nation? And nation. Go ahead. Um, I, there is so much research out there that shows how much difference a quality infant toddler program as well as a comprehensive preschool program can make in a child's life. Um, and why we don't provide this for every child is beyond me. But, but the picture that Rush painted of the brain itself, as Arturo understands in a way that most of us don't, uh, clinically, medically, scientifically, from a research perspective, do you think we need to make the case that this is, this is the picture of, this is the reality of a brain of a child who's from prenatal, the prenatal situation to three, this is what he or she, his or her brain is likely to look like, and this is the average brain of a boy or girl who, uh, who does not have that? Oh, it even goes beyond brain development. Um, if you uh, read uh, the book, How Children Succeed, it talks a lot about the fact that children in poverty are experiencing a lot of stressors. And that affects the whole 
uh, physical system, affects the immune system. Children who are raised in poverty, who endure stress in those early years, are much more likely to grow up to be adults who have experience heart disease and diabetes. You know, here's the tough part for me. We use the word stress. My concern, my fear, is that in New Jersey, just say New Jersey, you start saying, just from a um, devil's advocate point of view again, you start saying that a child who hasn't had these opportunities experiences some stress, you're likely to get back from a whole range of folks in this sta state, really, stress, is, is that what we're talking about? I feel the stress every day that I don't know how I'm gonna send my kid to college. I don't know how I'm going to pay my taxes. I don't know how I'm going to be able to afford to live in this state. And so the question then becomes, how do you get those folks who are the people who elect those who are in the legislature to care enough to want to change policy and make it a higher priority? Did I miss something, Arturo? Uh, yeah, I, I, I want to distinguish something. I see somebody else raising, rush, raising his hands. When we talk about the stress we're talking about, we're talking about toxic stress, if you will, based on example, Sean Coff's work. So, there's three levels of stress, right? There's positive stress. Positive stress is the stress one feels when they're gonna do some public speaking. Right. And then they do it and they get feedback and it improves or doesn't improve and whatever sure. happens, that's positive stress. No problem so far. Then there's tolerable stress. Tolerable stress is there's a death in the family and there's the right buffering and support systems for that individual and that stress becomes positive because it's part of life, you learn yes. from it, et cetera. Then there's toxic stress. Toxic stress is a child who experiences, for instance, repeated abuse or prolonged poverty without having buffering systems to support that child to grow. And those are the stresses that, as was said, will change the brain architecture to the point where the stress is so severe and so prolonged that there's hormonal changes. Wow. There's actual brain architectural changes, and the rest of the body is also affected, the immune system's impacted. Wow. And those are the children that will grow to be adults who not only suffer from what we would predict increased emotional and mental health uh, conditions, but in addition, independent of that, increased heart disease, diabetes, and so on and so forth. Things that are all, it's all inter interconnected. So when we're talking about- That's stress, not stress, stress. Right, That's right, a different kind right, of stress. seven year old, you know, uh, kind of challenges, challenges you, that's the word. I feel stressed. You. That's a stress, but that's not a toxic That's a healthy stress. stress. It could be a positive stress because sure. you're learning how to interact with her. It's probably it's not, this is not what we're talking about. I want to be clear. Correct. In the framing of it, just respectfully, right. the word stress triggers a lot of things in people right. because they're stressed about the conversation. Are you kidding me? I don't know what to do for my kid. And you're talking about stress is a di toxic stress. That's what we're it's talking totally about. different. And that's what the ACE studies are going to be based on. Rush, just say it. Yell it out. They told me to stand up. <laughs> yeah, right. You're like you needed help. Go ahead. But, but, but you're laying it out that every parent feels enormous stress, right? How many, how many people or parents have kids and found it to be overwhelming, nearly overwhelmingly <laughs> stressful? That's where not you, what we're where talking you about. Thought, where you thought about possibly hitting or striking your child. Most parents say, yeah, I've thought about it. But now, so now imagine a parent living in a dangerous neighborhood with not enough food, with working two or three jobs, with multiple children trying to help with homework and deal with the school and all of these, all of these other things on top. You've got every advantage to you. So you and the group that you know that say, hey, I feel stressed. Well, yeah, and you've got family around, you've got neighborhood around, you've got support. You've got everything. Imagine those families that are growing up in our low-income communities that don't have those advantages, that are facing a level of stress that have alcohol and drug abuse, mental health issues, substance use, a lot of other things that add to exponentially that level of stress that leads to, the science shows, that that leads to those poor health outcomes for those children, their future is affected. And so to that point, I'm convinced we can get people, not all, but most to care about those children and those families. Doctor? I, I just think we have to be careful. Um, of what? Uh, most children are not broken. 
And, and I think this gets this message across that children are broken. And there are a lot of children who really are suffering and in, in, in bad conditions, and this will help them. But there are a whole swath of other kids who are, are just not getting the opportunities they need to thrive. And, and so I, I think it's a really important argument, but we shouldn't focus just on that when we're talking about what is really a universal system Dr. of support. Respectfully, I'm going to push back and say this. My experience as a former, I used to say I was the youngest member elected to the state legislature and the youngest to lose his seat in the state legislature at 27. All true, it's not a joke. But I remember how hard it was to get people's attention. I remember how, and, and I remember sitting on the Finance and Appropriations Committee and, Seal, you, you're too young to remember this. Um, you remember people coming before the Appropriations Committee and I remember sitting on the committee with Advocacy group after advocacy group coming up and saying, we need a piece of this budget. And I'm telling you, even though that was 30 years ago, it ain't that much different and maybe even be harder because there was a surplus in New Jersey then to get people's attention. So I'm but saying- you're not going to get a universal program talking about the, the children who are suffering from toxic stress. Well, that, <laughs> we have to get their attention first and you're saying I, don't go say that I, way? I'm saying both and. I'm not saying either or. And but, I'm saying don't but just, you just talk about broken girls. children. Yes. <laughs> yes. I agree with what you're saying. Well, I'm just explaining the discussion. I agree 100% because we need to talk about every child. It was mentioned earlier that middle income children are probably standing to lose a lot, also are losing all right now because they're not getting. So we got to make their parents and that constituency understand. Yes, Seal, and I'll come back to you. Yes. So I think. And it goes back to what Dr. Chaudhry said at the beginning. I think to me this hinges on, all these arguments are effective, but the issue is one of responsibility. Whose responsibility is it? Is it a state responsibility? Is it a parent responsibility? When the court ordered the state to provide high quality preschool 20 years ago, that was an enormous shift, I think, in the public policy, the public mindset, that three, and five, three to five preschool, hey, that's education. That's the beginning of education. That's right. getting kids ready for school. It's shifted from being a parent responsibility to find high quality children. But the courts had to say that. But the courts had to say that. But I think, you know, it's taken 20 years, but our state has moved. I think there's much more understanding that maybe birth to three has that same element of a public responsibility too. And, and to, real quickly, the framing of it, the positioning of the argument, how do you think it sounds? I think you do need it all. I think, you know, we have Ed Waltz here who's helped us a lot with communications, and he challenged us this summer to think about birth to three in the context of education. If you want kids to succeed yeah. in school, as he says, you start in the in cradle, not the kindergarten, not in kindergarten. But, Seal, respectfully, if you can't get it all, what do we need the most? Because very rarely do you... What? what? That's the wrong question? You should sit in the legislature and see what that conversation is like respectfully. You don't get it all. I'm just, that's not devil's advocate, that's a fact. You don't get it all, so if you don't get it all, you, th you think we're gonna get it all? Professor, we're gonna get it all? You, what, what? Yes, tell everyone who you are. I'd love to get it all. I'm Cynthia Rice from Advocates for Children in New Jersey. So I, I want to get back to the priority issue is that, you know, I, I'm listening to all this and, and I, I do spend a lot of time in front of legislators and I, they don't have the specifics, but they get it. They understand, well, we should, you know, we should be providing this, but it's not a priority. And you know what? They find the money when they want the money. So how is it that we raise this level, both on the federal level and the state level? And what as New Jerseyans should, do you think we should be doing to move that? We, that's our goal is what is what Dr. All. Heinitz, but it, how do we move this forward and not get, you know, we've been getting crumbs. You talked about 15 million and 25 million. Well, the governor took back almost 6 million of that. So how is it that we move from crumbs to getting a loaf of bread for our children? And, and by the way, when I, when I talk about um, where the priorities are, and I don't mean crumbs, by the way, I mean of the, pri of the initiatives that are being talked about, what are the highest priorities? And from my experience, without prioritizing them and simply saying, no, we have to have it all. Respectfully, even though that makes more sense, even though the outcomes would be better, it is a hard argument to make before policymakers that it's all or nothing.
about it. But they're also looking for some visible ability to say, we did that. That's a good thing. Support us for that. That's the political reality. You're shaking your head. Does that make sense? That there's, that's part of it. Even though we know from a public policy point of view, would you say it's the next, how many generations? Of, it's a couple generations yeah, before least, we see. Yeah. Tr- that's a tough. But, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Right. And I think, I mean, there are a couple, um, I mean, one um, big, I think, um, progress is that we're, we are now um, in our legislatures and our governor's offices, we have uh, individuals who have firsthand experience raising kids, being extremely invo- involved fathers. There are more women who are mothers. These people uh, understand this very viscerally. Like all parents are stressed, right? And so I think with that argument, you can say, yeah, sure, wouldn't it have been less stressful for you if you had some help during those lowest earning years of your That's life right. when your kids were young? Or that your daughter, who's now str- struggling to balance work and family, had some help? Or maybe she didn't have to quit her job because it didn't offer any paid leave? It's for all of us. Right. Yep. So. Uh, so I, I will challenge you on one thing. I, I think the world has changed a bit in 30 years. Um, in this way, I mean, we, there's been public opinion polling. The public wants this. I mean, public opinion polling um, in the last five years, wherever it's been done, has rated um, uh, advancing early education um, as one of the most important issues. And even when for, asked, even when asked, it. right. Oh, more than two thirds say they would pay higher taxes for, for universal education. And where it's been put on the ballot, um, in eight out of the nine last, eight out of nine times that it's been put on the ballot in places like Cincinnati and San Antonio, all over the country. Direct referendum. D- direct it referendum. Approved. It was it's approved. been approved with wow. sales tax increases, with tied to pay, tied to paying more money for it, um, and it's going to go on the ballot more. And I would say it, so. There will be some electoral pressure around this. I mean, to do it, these it, things. Yes. I mean, so for example, Mayor um, De Blasio of New York. Um, separated himself. He came from fourth place and separated himself in a very competitive democratic field. In New he was York not City. city by saying, by making this his campaign issue. I mean, he was not leading in the polls, but there are many families who have been through this over the last generation who sort of vote on these issues. And I think you will see that more often, um, and especially in 2018, where you have 30 gubernatorial elections. I expect that in some gubernatorial elections, this will be an issue that would be a, 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 a motivating issue for drawing people to the polls. Hey, gentlemen, we'll close on this note because the conversation will continue. I think you're right. I do think you're right that when asked and pressed in most public policy, excuse me, public opinion polls, that that's how people would say they feel. My concern and the argument that I feel strongly we need to make is that policymakers sometimes don't want to get out in front, even if those polls say that, because I've seen public opinion polls where people say this is what they want and are willing to pay more, but policymakers are afraid to be out front to find out whether it's really true or not when tested. I want to believe that. I want to believe that the new administration in Trenton is open to this, that leaders like Senator Vitale, who will join us tomorrow in our forum, will lead that fight, that we are a different kind of state and that most folks want a certain kind of state. And I think you said it so well. Um, I don't know about the rest of the country. I don't know how you make this federal policy. I don't believe right now that the mood is anywhere remotely, as I just described in New Jersey, in Washington with those who are in power and what they seem, could be wrong, to care about and who they seem to care about. I hope and pray that I'm wrong about that. I will also say this, finally, this conversation with the choir, even though there are different notes being played by different people around the edges, if you will. None of this will happen. None of this will um, occur if this group does not continue the fight in the way you are. So from my perspective, the Right From the Start NJ initiative needs all of you. We need you to be engaged. Comment on the site. Comment on this forum. Post your questions, engage others, get folks to follow us. Listen, if it's not the government funding right from the start, NJ, it's Terrell and Nicholson, private money. Not criticizing, but we just know there isn't money to do that on the state level. And so for me, this has been incredibly helpful. For those of you who are saying, why did Steve raise those issues? 
It's because I, my job is to ask questions, you know? And I'm confident we will come to a better place because of the folks here. And by the way, one more time for our co-authors. Thank you. And for our distinguished panel. Thank you, SEAL and Advocates for Children in New Jersey for bringing us together, Arturo for being committed with the foundation uh, to this effort. And I look forward to being a small part of a very important conversation, not just for our four children, but way more importantly, for all the other children and the families that continue to suffer unnecessarily. Thank you so much. So before you all leave, and we have the opportunity for you to meet the authors and have your book signed, we hope that this is the beginning of a movement. I'm looking around this room. These, you're all, you're absolutely right. You are the choir. You've believed in these issues. You've worked these issues. You've done your piece of these issues for years. But I think we are at this moment in time where we get the opportunity to advance this as a more comprehensive agenda. Um, Sure, it's a tough time on the federal level, on the state level, but if we don't start talking about it now, we'll be here five years from now in the same place. Um, and I think there's some momentum growing for this. We wanna be part of that. And that's part of the intent of right from the start. So I'd urge you to go on the website as Steve suggested, and we'll be getting an email out to you to sign up to join this campaign. ACNJ's role in this is to launch an advocacy effort. We've started by looking at the need to improve access to quality childcare for babies. We know there's much more in this agenda. There's how do we support parents more effectively? How do we deal with health issues? And we do wanna join with all of you to pull together that bigger agenda and quite honestly, make some noise about it, make some demands. You know, when Steve talks about priorities, I don't think we wanna be in the position where we have to define priorities among what should be a comprehensive, thorough agenda. And I think our voices together can do that. Um, I'm just gonna ask, I don't know if there are any last minute comments from the panel um, to, to wrap up before we um, go to the book signing. I'm gonna start with the authors and just go right down the table. Sure. Um, so obviously we wrote the book because we believe that you have to do all these things, that these things have to come together and fit together. And so we are building towards a comprehensive agenda. We did see the book as a shared responsibility of the federal government and state governments across the country. And we do, th so I'm no expert on sort of the current policy issues in uh, New Jersey, but I do think that there are opportunities and places you can prioritize for what a state can do. Um, you have the opportunity to build on your current, it's always easier to build on your program than to create a new program. So you have paid leave here, but your paid leave program could be vastly improved. Um, it could be made more progressive. You cut off uh, contributions at something like 30 something thousand dollars. A lot of people in New Jersey make more than that and it's fair to ask for more um, on you know, what's, what ends up being you know, a few dollars a month. Um, from folks. Um, it should be for 12 weeks, I would say, and it should cover a higher part portion of, so, the, so for example there, you have the Abbott program. You can expand the Abbott program to higher income levels um, um, uh, or, or, or stay preschool. You don't have to call it the Abbott program for everybody, you can call it stay preschool. So they're, they're, those are two platforms that are the most within the control of the state. Um, you could also establish a refundable child care tax credit. Um, that would um, support families for all types of care um, that piggybacked on the federal credit. Could be more generous than the federal credit. There's no reason not to. Again, that would not, that would be, you know, it would be an, a, a, a loss in revenue, not asking more revenue. And then I do think that in the context of having to address um, uh, the, the, the state tax infrastructure, there will be need to be some discussion around priorities and sort of how we think about the expense side, but also how we structure um, the state taxes um, to, to be more equitable and to, and to fight inequality. And I think we still believe that the most important place to fight inequality is with babies. Thank you. And I, I want to thank our hosts and just just add, it's really exciting to have this this conversation about the broader inequalities and how to narrow them and starting really, really early. And I agree that there seems to be moments in certain states, New Jersey being one of them, that we can do something really, really meaningful. Um, and so it's exciting to be part of that conversation. So thank you. Um, thank you for being here and um, just following up on um, uh, Ajay. 
-hmm. AJ's. That's fine. I go either way. <laughs> um, comments about family leave. It is one of the priorities of the um, current administration, and um, there has been a lot of movement to make the improvements that he just talked about to raise the level of the um, the, the the wage replacement and the cap to uh, extend the number of days uh, to create job protections. Those all went, um, th those um, provisions uh, were, were approved by the legislature, sent to the governor's uh, desk and um, were uh, vetoed by Christie, but there's no doubt that they are going to come back um, and, um, and hopefully move forward very quickly. Uh, but, but, but people don't know about the program, and the program itself, um, if they do know about it, they do not um, know all, all the, the provisions. Uh, so there needs to be more out, uh, outreach and education about it, um, and that's included in the bill. So thank you. Thank you for having me today. Um, I just want to end by saying that parents need to be engaged. We're talking about parents who need childcare and they're, they're lacking the resources to provide for their children. And what I like most about the plan is that there's something for everyone. So if you're at the lower end of the economic spectrum, there's something for you. If you're at the higher end and you still need help, there's something for you. But I wanna make sure that we engage parents. This is just not an advocate's conversation, it's a family conversation. So um, I'm old, I just had a birthday, and I'm getting cranky. And, I'm, and I'm, I've been working on this for over 40 years, and I'm I just, I'm, I'm not willing to just say, well, let's just settle for this or let's just settle for that. And I, I wanna paraphrase, because I don't have an exact quote, what one of the, our New Jersey Supreme Court justices said to, the, um, to a former administration that were, that were stalling on implementing the Abbott Preschool Program as it was intended. And that justice said, how many more children do we have to fail before you get this right? And every year we don't do this is another year in a child's, in a many, many millions of children's lives across the country who are, who are, who were anyway, and we have to do it right. I applaud the cradle to kindergarten approach to um, meeting the needs of our children in the state. Um, at the early head start, we start with the pregnant women. We hold their hands through uh, the, um, whole process uh, until they give birth. Um, and in Early Head Start and Head Start, we see so many success stories, both with the children and with the, uh, the uh, parents. Parents who go from being homeless to being bachelor degreed homeowners. Um, uh, parents who um, are immigrants, who uh, are so invested in their child's education that they are involved at the school, they're involved at home, reading to their children. Um, at a recent opening of one of our centers, we had a former Head Start child, five years old, read to us our mission statement and our promise. Um, those are the success stories we see in Early Head Start. And as we continue to, to grow as a state in our commitment to young children, uh, I strongly believe that the Early Head Start program and the Head Start program need to be at the table and be part of this mixed delivery system so that the comprehensive services that families who are at risk, whether it because um, they are struggling to become acclimated to this community um, or because of poverty um, that they get these services and they get the support that they need so that they can support their children because they are the child's first teacher. So join me again in thanking this panel.
I feel like our marching orders, our agenda has been laid out. Um, before we break, uh, for you to meet the authors and have your books autographed, I really do want to acknowledge the one person in this room who made this possible. This started as a conversation in our office where I think I said, wow, I just read this interesting book. Wouldn't it be interesting to pull something together, see if the authors will come and start a conversation? That's pretty much all I did to bring today together. <laughs> it was Diane Delano who made that a reality. So thank you, Diane, uh, for pulling this together. This panel, the whole discussion has been taped, so we'll have an opportunity to use it. This is not the end of the conversation. It's the beginning. Um, and we'll be in touch with all of you to join this movement. So thank you for coming today.